Hello again, 240. In this video, we will begin Chapter 9, America's Great Dilemma, with a view of the fight of the century. There will be a number of these in the 20th century, and now we are at the beginning of the 20th century. And what is the state of race relations at this time? Ever since the heavyweight championship became formalized by the promotions of Richard Kyle Fox, as you'll recall, black heavyweights were denied opportunities to challenge white champions. Early in his reign, the popular champion John L. Sullivan announced that he would take on all challengers if the money was right, but with confronted with the possibility of such formidable opponents as George Godfrey and Peter Jackson, he modified that pronouncement. In this challenge, I include all fighters, first come, first served, who are white. I will not fight a Negro. I never have and never shall. Such a rationale was confirmed by a New York Times editorial that suggested a victory by a black challenger would permit ignorant brothers to misinterpret his victory as justifying claims to much more than physical equality with their white neighbors. Hmm. It was therefore fitting that when Jack Johnson successfully defended his heavyweight championship in 1910, Sullivan was in the audience. Born in Galveston, Texas in 1878, that's an island off the coast of Houston in South Texas, Johnson survived a rough childhood and dropped out of school after the sixth grade. As a teenager, he fought in the Texas bare knuckle circuit and moved on to the national level. By 1903, he had defeated the best black heavyweights and held the unofficial title of Negro heavyweight champion. However, he was repeatedly rebuffed by leading white heavyweights when he attempted to arrange a challenge. Champions Jim Corbett, Bob Fitzsimmons, Jim Jeffries, and Marvin Hart ignored his existence just as they had refused to fight such quality fighters as Sam Langford, Sam McVeigh, and Joe Jeanette. Jack Johnson got his opportunity when reigning heavyweight champion Tommy Burns of Canada agreed to a match at Rush Cutters Bay near Sydney, Australia. Burns needed a payday and Johnson was delighted to oblige. The cocky but undersized Burns, he weighed only 175 pounds, believed that his Anglo-Saxon heritage would enable him to defeat a much larger challenger who stood 6 feet 2 inches and weighed a trim 190 pounds. Johnson, however, pounded the overmatched Burns at will until officials stopped the action in the 13th round. Johnson's victory set off a racial crisis for millions of white Americans who could not accept the fact that an African American now wore boxing's most prestigious crown. Johnson's persistent flaunting of prevailing racial customs greatly exacerbated the situation. He appeared in public wearing stylish clothing and expensive jewelry, drove high-powered luxury automobiles, and enjoyed the company of attractive white women. During the, his lifetime, Johnson was married to three different white women by flaunting one of the most sensitive taboos of the racial code. The independent and self-assured Johnson understood that he was inviting trouble. With Johnson the undisputed champion, a desperate search for a great, great white hope commenced in the United States. Much to the chagrin of white supremacists, the thin pool of talent failed to produce a challenger who inspired confidence. Ultimately, the quest focused upon James Jeffries, who had enjoyed a successful six-year tenure as heavyweight champion, defending his title nine times without a loss after wresting the title away from Bob Fitzsimmons in 1899. With no viable challenger in the offing, Jeffries retired in 1905 to his alfalfa farm near Los Angeles. His reputation rivaled that of John L. Sullivan. He was a powerful left-handed slugger whose size and strength were his greatest assets. He was willing to absorb heavy punishment in order to wear down his opponents before unleashing his own powerful blows. He broke three of his challenger's ribs. Boxing experts yet today Consider him among the greats of all heavyweight champions. The popular novelist and ardent spokesman for white supremacy, Jack London, famous Alaska Gold Rush pioneer, uh, author of White Fang and Call of the Wild, perhaps best expressed the thinking of millions when he urged Jeffries to abandon retirement to reclaim the championship for the white race. Jeff, it's up to you, he implored. 
the white race must be rescued. After nearly six years of retirement, Jeffries was not ready to fight any professional boxer, let alone the superbly talented Johnson. Jeffries had ballooned to 300 pounds from his fighting weight of 225. Eventually, he relented to the pressure, persuaded by a guarantee of over $150,000 in fees and movie rights. At times, Jeffries professed indifference to the overriding racial overtones, saying only, It's the money I'm after, man. But on other occasions, he said he was motivated by the desire to regain the title for the white race. Promoter Tex Rickard originally announced that the fight would be held in San Francisco, but anti-prize -fight fighting groups forced him to seek another site. After considering several options, in mid-June he settled on the small town of Rito, Nevada. Home to 17,000 residents, nearly all white, Reno was located on the main line of the Union Pacific Railroad. Rickard was encouraged by the strong support of local businessmen and assurances from Governor Denver Dickerson that state and local officials would be welcoming. Rickard announced that the bout would be held on July 4, 1910. Nevadans recognized an economic bonanza when they saw one. A wooden stadium to accommodate 22,000 spectators was hastily erected just east of town, and for a few weeks the high desert town became the center of national attention. Both fighters set up training camps at Reno resorts, normally the temporary residences of wealthy women establishing a six-month residency requirement before appearing in a Reno divorce court. Pre-fight press coverage revolved almost exclusively around the matter of race. To read the media coverage of 100 years ago is to be stunned by the crude racial slurs that were commonplace at that time. Some southern white editors grimly predicted a race war if the Big Bear from California failed to defeat Jeff Johnson and white ministers were reported to have prayed from their pulpits for a Jeffries victory. So-called boxing experts weighed in with all types of assessments, many of them building upon popular racial stereotypes that alleged that African Americans lacked the intelligence and courage to win such an important contest. Novelist Rex Beach typically wrote that Jeffries would win because of breeding and education. Betting odds on the fight anticipated a Jeffries victory. In the days immediately before the fight, many thousands of fight fans, including a large assortment of gamblers, pickpockets, prostitutes, and scam artists, descended upon Reno, where businessmen eagerly awaited the anticipated economic bonanza. After the enormous buildup, the fight proved anticlimactic. After Johnson entered the outdoor ring under a blazing sun and surveyed the sea of white faces as he later wrote of his experience, I felt the auspiciousness of the occasion. I realized that my victory in this event meant more than on any previous occasion. It wasn't just the championship that was at stake. It was my own honor, and in a degree, the honor of my race. An estimated 22,000 spectators packed the stadium. They saw Johnson cruise to an easy victory over a former champion long past his prime. Much too fast for his opponent, Johnson punished him with lightning-quick jabs and powerful counterpunches, all the while taunting him for his ponderous efforts. During the middle rounds, Johnson seemed to merely to toy with his plotting adversary, but in round 15, he hit the already dazed Jeffries with a series of powerful combinations, and the former champion slumped to the canvas for the first time in his career. He bravely fought on, but after the third knockdown, his corner conceded, and Rickard stopped the fight at a count of seven, just before a knockout would have been registered. An eerie science descended over the arena. Disappointed, Jeffrey's backers shuffled out of the stadium and headed downtown to drown their sorrows at Reno's 60 taverns. Across the nation, a series of violent incidents occurred when white gangs took out their disappointment on innocent African Americans. Random knifings and beatings reminded everyone that the status of African Americans had not changed, and I'm sure there was lynchings that went on as well, a terrible occurrence in the early 20th century. In fact, racial emotions unleashed by this prize fight constituted a major setback to any hopes for racial reconciliation. 
And there's a famous picture of Johnson and Jeffries. And there's Jack Johnson and there's Jeffries. And this is from the Special Collections of the University of Nevada Reno Library. The fight exposed raw, visceral racial attitudes that were not easily forgotten. The fight had opened a large chasm in American society. As Thomas Hytala observes, when Tex Rickard raised his hand in victory, Johnson stood proudly at the summit, and symbolically, millions of African Americans stood beside him. For Johnson and his people, the championship seemed a partial but promising fulfillment of their collective hopes and dreams, a portent of a future brighter than their troubled past and present. By beating the Great White Hope, Johnson also set in motion a series of events that would overwhelm him. He was hit by a powerful racially inspired backlash led by the United States government. In 1913, he was convicted of violating the Mann Act, a vaguely written federal law passed by Congress in 1910 intended to curb interstate prostitution. The Department of Justice used Johnson's frequent interstate train trips with willing white women to make its tenuous case. Johnson thereupon fled the country and defended his crown in Europe several times. With his skills having diminished over the years, Johnson lost to Jess Willard in Havana in a 26-round knockout in 1915. In 1920, Johnson returned to the United States, surrendered to authorities, and served one year in the federal prison at Leavenworth, Kansas. Upon his release, he fought a few inconsequential bouts for much-needed paydays, traveled the vaudeville and carnival circuit, and died in 1946 in a car accident in North Carolina.